Good morning. I was told last evening by our moderator that I have 12 minutes for the presentation. <laughs> last time when I presented it, they gave me 30 minutes and I didn't finish. <laughs> so I'm a little puzzled how to do it. First, my apologies for the translator. I sent them the. Pre I sent the. Thank you. I sent my PowerPoint to the translator. And in my mind, I had the idea of adding three or four slides. But I, when I heard the news that I have 12 minutes, I realized that I'll have to run through and cut quite a lot of the presentation. But I can't start without a minor one or two preliminary notes. So I'll take about two minutes for a few introductions, about five minutes to tell you what is the area that I'm studying, and another five minutes to tell you my findings. And I'll be delighted if in the question and answer you ask questions about the study so I can elaborate. I got an email last night from a friend after the events in France that says, see, we should have abolished all religions and nothing would have happened in France. So I spent about half an hour telling this person that life is not that simple. But it's also alluded to what kind of research I'm doing. Somehow, in an unplanned way, about 20 years ago, I started studying the role of religion in the quality of life of people, in enhancing social environment, in improving quality of life, and I found that wherever I want to talk about something negative about religion, I have journalists ready to interview me, I have people ready to put me on podiums. But when I find that religion is helpful to people and does good thing, there's very little interest in what I'm doing. But that's the area of research that I'm interested in. So a few years back, and that's, I'm moving now to the area I'm studying today, I started working on what's called valuation. Some people who have a business background here in this room would know it a little better. People who have no knowledge about business may have heard the word but don't know much about it. So valuation is an economic field that tries to assess in dollar terms or whatever currency you use, what is the value, real value of things. So I'm going to give you a few, two examples that are in my presentation. I can do each one of them for 10 minutes. But imagine that you want to buy an airline. For some reason, you have the money, you have the interest, and you want to buy an airline. The simple question is to ask how much money they made last year. That would be very simple. But a value of an airline is much more than how much money they made. They may have routes to certain places that no one else. They may have gates. They may have good airplanes that come with them. A work, bad airplane that you have to replace. They may have good pilots, mechanics. There's endless thing that goes with the term of the value, what an airline worth. So that's business. Now we're going to the soft side of things. What is the value of things that don't have monetary values? So with my student, I usually take about an hour to tell them what is the value of love? Not what it does here, what it does here with your money. And usually the students say, no, 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 no. Love is pure. Love is from the heart. And then I go with them stage, step by step, I tell to tell them, look guys, at one point, it's an exchange of money. You send flowers. You buy chocolate. You take out for a restaurant. And before you go out, and especially for the ladies in the room, you invest in perfumes. You invest in hairdo. You invest in clothing. And not to mention diamond ring, if it's got to this stage, so to say that love doesn't have valuation is inappropriate. And then I say to the student, remember 
the time that you really, really felt high because you were in love. About 80% of them can do it. Then ask them, how much would you pay to feel it again? And slowly we got to say, okay, it's not exactly the same, but yes, it's costly. In order to go through the whole process of love, we have to pay. Well, I did about 20 pages of my PowerPoints. What I try to do is to find ways that I can value what a congregation, a religious congregation, in this case in the United States, is worth to the people in this society, in this community. My claim is that congregations are doing a lot for the benefit of people in their environment, in their community, that those things can be monetized, can have financial value, which then say to people, you know, don't take it lightly. If you close this congregation, if you don't have this congregation, you will lose a lot. In the PowerPoint and in the paper that I'm writing, there is a case from St. Louis, Missouri. A friend of mine studied every 10 years in every community, the number of congregation and the quality of life in this community. And what she and her colleagues show is that every area that congregation closed down, 10 years later, there was a major decrease in all measures of quality of life. In other words, congregations that we take in, at least many of my friends and many of my colleagues take very lightly, have a major value to the people in this community. Now I'm going to skip the sixth method that we usually use when we measure valuation. It's a fascinating lecture, but my colleagues on the podium would not like me to talk about it. What I did, those are the, so there's a challenge in congregation how to measure it. Again, I hope you'll ask me and challenge me about it. The one example that I had here, and I'm skipping, is our congregation involved in preventing suicide? Yes. How can we quantify it? I can talk anywhere between five minutes to five hours about it. What we did, the first stage we did a small study in Philadelphia of 10 congregations at the bottom line paper. The first to tell you about how to do valuation in uh, nonprofit organization congregation. The bottom line is the 10 congregations that we did in Philadelphia. We showed that it can be done. This one, we wanted to do 100 congregations in three cities. We're only able to do 90. We failed in Chicago, basically because our research assistant didn't complete the work. And when we reviewed the uh, data, we realized that 10 congregations are not worthy. So we look at six things, and I will explain them very, very briefly. What is, how much time do I have? About six minutes. Good. So we did about, we call something individual uh, impact. How much time by the, con lay the clergy, staff, and volunteers is being spent on helping people in the community. Direct spending, how much money the congregation spent. What is the budget? And there are many studies that show that 80% of congregation budget is spent locally. And I can cite you studies that show that many local businesses from flower shops, from boiler uh, repair people, are supported and making the living by support by congregation and salaries. Many people are employed, as I'll show very soon, by congregation having this full salary from congregation and of course pay taxes. Magnet effects are things that come from tourism. People who come to congregation from out of town and spend money in town in the community. Education and school. Many schools from daycare to high school. We didn't count university in this respect, although there is a study that follow us that did two universities show that 
saving my having private religious education save a lot of money to the community that has impact on lower taxes on the ability to give better school to people who are not going sending the children the value of open space it's marginal but it's important and finally the quality of care that they do so what did we find um, if you look at the nine 90 congregations that we study on average their financial contribution to the local economy is 2.6 million dollar some give much less some give much more this is a significant number when a congregation deal with city council with inspector who said to them, we are getting support from the public and you're doing nothing for us. They can pull this number and say, uh-uh. We are doing a lot for the collective. We are contributing from our resources to the collective. I will skip this. <coughs> If we took out the 10 rich one, okay, because the 10 rich one is a big congregation with lots of money, we drop them out of the sample, we still get that an average congregation contribute about $2 million. Some people told us, well, the issues like helping immigrants, helping newcomers, preventing suicide, include enhancing values are not things that we want to see in your analysis. What would be your number without it? $1.6 million. Now, that's, I can skip if I may. Those are the six areas that I described very briefly and I know I did it very briefly. But this is how they're distributed. We will have a report coming out soon, so those who will be interested can see it in a more equal, clear way. On average, every congregation in a sample, the, from the poor to the very rich, provide 4.7 different social programs that enhance the quality of life in the community. And in all of them, there are many more people who benefit who are not members of the congregation. Because the first thing people ask me when I present it, yeah, of course they have program there. It's, for, it's a club, it's for their own members. I can tell you that this is not the case. The services are geared to the community. In the 90 congregation, we have over 1,000 paid position. That means a thousand people are being paid full salary from the donation of congregational member. It's not money that comes from government. It's not money that comes from private foundation. It's all donation from members. Out of them, only 16% are clergy. The other can be teacher, music director, custodians, and the like. The average, which is very misleading, was five per congregation, because the rich congregation have 30, 40, and the poor congregation have at best one. So, how much time do I have? Yeah, rushed faster than I expected, which is good. What we found is that congregation that usually talk about themselves in the form that we instill values. We are the good people in society. We are the place where people come to uplift the spirit are actually an economic drive within the community. They are an organization that raise donations from members, sometimes from other sources, 
and produce goods in the community. This is the place where people come not only for worship, I'm talking about the American uh, United States, Canada experience, people come also for social events, for reunions, for events that the congregation enable people to benefit. There are many daycare centers in the American context that are being run on congregational building. There are many social programs, polling station on election day. All those events are contribution to the quality of life of people in, in this case, Philadelphia, Fort Worth, Texas, and Chicago, but I claim all over the United States. Most importantly, I believe that this study, and I hope many people will challenge me and contribute their own research to show that my numbers were too high or too low, and that I ignored and missed certain issues, but now there is a language that clergy can come and say to mayors, to people who oppose them, look, this is the magnitude of our contribution. Don't look at us that we only have one or two clergy. Don't look at us that we only meet two or three times a week. We are an engine that is important for the economy and the quality of life of the community. Thank you.